Welcome. Welcome. My name is Peter Wanders. I'm the president and CEO of Anderson Ranch. I got a new hat, but the truth is it really distracts me. <laughs> I'm really excited to have all of you here on behalf of our board of trustees, our chair, Sue Hostetler, and all the staff. We want to welcome you. We're really excited about this uh, summer series, and we're really, really excited about our honorees this week. So thank you for being here. Quick note, we're super excited to have all the doors open um, and uh, all the windows open. As all of you remember from past years, we would welcome you all to this beautiful campus and we would close the doors, we would close all the blinds so that you could see the screen. Uh, but one of the things we did during COVID was figure out some ways to, to open the doors. It got a new screen, so a real quick shout out thanks to uh, Reggie Smith and Lee. Reggie's our incoming chair, but they underwrote our new projector. So <laughs> we'll thank them for all the fresh air. Um, Real quick, this series is underwritten by Toby Devin Lewis. Uh, many of you know Toby from town here and the legacies uh, for artists she created through the Progressive Collection and all the work she did. So her being associated with the series is just super special to us. Uh, Oolite Arts, the art center in Miami. I think Dennis is in the room somewhere. He can raise his hand. Um, really matches some of the power that, that was created by, by Toby and the art, young artists and the careers that he's cultivating in Miami and the Miami art scene. So we're super thankful. Uh, for Oolite as well. Got to keep track of my notes, I'm sorry. Uh, the recognition week um, that we're having this week, there was a um, dinner and a movie last night, a Gorilla Girls lecture yesterday, today's lecture, we'll have a talk tomorrow, uh, the dinner tomorrow night. All those are made possible by some underwriters as well. Um, and so we really want to thank quickly Lugano Diamonds for their support and Coldwell Banker. So a shout out to both of them for what they do. Chrissy's Auction House is also helping us as is Pure Insurance and Art Services. So we're thrilled to have them here as well. So now that I've gotten all the good work out of the way, I'm going to pass over to Helen. Helen, we are thrilled to have you on the team. You've helped curate these great conversations and we'll let you introduce the program today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, it's great to see you all in person. It's great to be in person. It's great to have a packed house. Um, I confess, I'm completely fangirled out. Um, I'm on the stage with two people whose work has really changed um, two really powerful things for me. Simone's work has changed how I feel about sculpture, and Sadia's work has changed how I think about history. And so to take two great big huge categories like that and work within them uh, and from outside of them to turn them inside out and to show us something new about each of them is profound. So um, just a little bit about um, Simone and her history with the ranch when I first got here. Pretty much the first thing I did when I saw the kiln yard was take a photograph of it and text it to Simone and say, do you want to come here and make work? Because this is a place where, um, you know, really we try to put artists at the center of what we do and help them make things that they couldn't make without us. And so like that was just super, super exciting. We of course had no idea when we planned this summer's events that Simone would also be um, our country's representative in the Venice Biennale next year. <laughs> um, I remember it was a year of, you know, I don't know about you, but I just lived through a global pandemic and um, it was a year of bad news. And the day the internet let us know that Simone had been chosen for Venice was like a really bright light in an otherwise rough year. So I'm saying this to you also just to let you know um, that Simone is here now, uh, that she's taken this time away from her studio away from the work that we need her to be doing, that we want her to be doing, that only she can do, is extremely generous and we're very grateful. Um, and uh, we're eager to both celebrate her and let her get back to her work. Because <laughs> we know, uh, we can only, I'm, I'm sure we can all only imagine what it is like uh, to think about um, representing us 
uh, at this moment in our history uh, as a nation and as a people, as a civilization and a culture. Um, she will be in dialogue today with her very good friend, Sadia Hartman, the writer and historian. Uh, Sadia is a professor at Columbia University in New York and the recent recipient of a MacArthur Genius Award. Um, <laughs> The only people who really want the genius scare quotes around Sadia are Sadia. Um, the rest of us are like, the genius award. Um, so there's that. But Sadia's um, new book, which has one of the best titles ever, uh, which is called, I've got to read it in its perfection, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Riotous Black Girls, Troublesome Women, and Queer Radicals. I'm like, Yes. Um, but Sadia's work is really changing how we write history, from what vantage point we might write history, and what kinds of stories are possible when we frame history uh, through different lenses and ask of it different questions. Um, it is very rare and precious in a cultural moment when artists and historians and theorists and dancers are in dialogue with one another. And Simone has a group of people around her that help to create this extraordinary body of work that she's been making. And um, to be witness today to some of the kinds of conversations that happen between Simone and Sidea is an extreme privilege and one that I'm happy to turn the stage over to them now. So thank you. You wouldn't give us a time <laughs> signal, like maybe in 20 minutes, like at 1.40. Well, um, it is a pleasure to be here today. It's a beautiful place, and it's a pleasure to be here with my friend and collaborator, Simone Lee. And I just want to like shout out to yeah. our friends, to our friends and collaborators in the audience. You know who you are? Should we call their names, Simone? I think so. Okay. Autumn and Autumn Deb Knight, Deborah hey. Anzinger, <laughs> Oakley, <laughs> and, and Tina, Tina Camp, Camp, and Julian is here somewhere. Yes. Julian, and then Tao is here. And, and Tao. Tao is here, and, and Christina. Um, shout out to my gallery. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, in her introduction, uh, Helen touched on something that's very important, and that is really the space of collaboration. Um, I'm in this dialogue with Simone today. I'm neither an art historian nor an art critic. Um, I'm a thinker and writer whose engagement with Simone's work has actually left an imprint on my own. And I think, um, you know, we are fortunate right now, and this is something that you talk about, Simone, in these really, um, in so many ways, in these really awful times, we also have this embarrassment of riches, and that yeah. is the kind of the collaboration across these disciplinary lines that is, you know, unfolding. And so I feel like I very much think with Simone's work and, um, and an important place to begin is really thinking about the, the status um, and the importance of um, the labor of the black femme or the black female, what that critical labor is. And it seems that in your practice for a really long time, I feel that you have been developing um, both a critical language that um, is involved in, I would, you know, use this kind of heavy-handed, pretentious term, like the transvaluation of values. And what do I mean by that? <laughs> um, it really a way of kind of contesting um, an order of valuation in both the kind of the social world we live in and in the art world about black women's critical and creative labor. So I would ask you to just begin there to talk about the centrality of that um, in your practice 
because it seems that you've approached it in many ways, both as someone who's trying to archive these practices, trying to excavate, and as well, you know, adding to and extending it. First of all, thank you, Sadia. It's um, really wonderful to be um, having this conversation with you now. Uh, I just finished. Um, do I sound okay? Yeah. I feel like I sound a we little crazy a little echo to myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just finished doing the clay modeling for bronze for this show in Venice. And so I do feel like I'm reflecting on the last year, which has been so difficult, but also it's been um, really liberating for me and exciting for me at the same time. So I had so many mixed feelings about the year. Um, but I am often um, thinking about you and your work because I feel like um, you've been like the theory and I've been the practice, <laughs> you know? And it is fun to feel like when I'm working, I'm doing uh, my own version of critical fabulation. Um, and that is the fun part of sculpture, that you can collapse time by bringing different forms together or um, by the inclusion of sound, um, like in the Rizzi piece, or even with texture. Um, and also you can um, think about and move through history in a kind of way that I feel like very privileged to sculpture. So um, I just feel like I get to do the fun part and you're doing all the hard work for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if you wanna um, you know, talk more in detail both about um, the RISD piece or loophole, because it seems that, I mean, your work does have this research component to it, right? But you um, are not limited to that. I was thinking about, you know, there is the kind of the creation, the recreation, the reimagining of, um, you know, historical events, like in the kind of sound installation at the Guggenheim show, or what it meant to put, um, a certain sonic text next to a certain kind of history of the art canon in the RISD Museum. So I don't know if you wanted to speak more about just the, the details of some of those things, just for people maybe who don't know, um, you know, don't know about that. Well, um, and there's always a uh, underlying text to every exhibition, and sometimes I talk about it, sometimes I don't. Um, I try to use um, all of these things that an artist is asked to do um, to have an exhibition in a museum, which is, you know, the public talk, the broadsheet handout, the um, wall text as opportunities to um, collaborate with others. That's why we created the uh, broadsheet for the new museum, which was... Um, completely created by you and Nancy Mutiti who designed that broadsheet um, to bring in um, a lot of the information that may be opaque because unfortunately we don't all share the same knowledge. Um, also, I've always been interested in almost every exhibition in the knowledge production of black women in general. Um, and so I try and take advantage um, of those, you know, of, I try to figure out a way to uh, have that on display in the work when I make roses repetitively or the same pot over and over again, or, um, you know, by creating conferences or dialogues or the Free People's Medical Clinic, just finding different ways to show um, the technologies black women use to share knowledge and to create knowledge. Yeah, you have this um, great um, quote that I want to read. I think of it as a, a short, um, a brilliant short manifesto or polemic. <laughs> okay, and so I'll just read it. Um, and so this was in response to uh, some, let's, let us say, uninformed criticism in response to the Whitney Biennial. But I thought it was oh. such a brilliant 
articulation of um, black feminist and black radical thought. And you say, um, I need to say that if you haven't read not a single thing by Sadia Hartman or Hortense Spillers, and if you have no knowledge, never heard of negritude or how it's related to surrealism, if you don't know who Senghor is or why he would do anything with art, if you have never spent any time figuring out who was and who wasn't at Festac 77, if you have no idea what critical fabulation is, if you don't know what I meant when I said in the wake, if you've never studied independence architecture, if you don't know why Pauline Lumumba walked through the streets of Kinshasa bare-breasted, if you have no idea who Catherine Dunham is or her scholarship, but yet you consider yourself well-versed in the contributions of the woman she hired as a secretary, Maya Darren, if the words black feminist thought bring absolutely zero concepts to mind, and you go on just kind of laying out a number of references. I was, I was pissed off. No, but, but <laughs> you know, then you lack the knowledge to recognize the radical gestures in my work. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that I really love about this statement, I mean, I think that I sh should say, you know, the power of the work is that it speaks and it speaks to those who are not familiar with this specific range of reference, there's a kind of power of the encounter with the sculpture. But what I also, you know, love about that is precisely related to your comments. Like what you're doing is you're not simply, I don't know, applying the knowledge that is that already exists in the world, right? You're expanding it. You're contributing to it. And I think that um, in the work itself, there's a this like practice of formal assemblage, right? I think you call it realized form sometimes. Yeah. Um, but you also do that with thought, and it seems mm -hmm. that um, that is a way that um, you're also involved very subtly in this contestation around value, around knowledge production, around the kind of critical parameters that are required to actually um, understand the work of art. Um, and you're transforming those concepts um, in the context of your engagement. And I guess I wonder, like, so do you think about that as you're making a piece of work? Like, you have this wide um, range of reference at your fingertip, and some of it is clearly very, um, you know, conscious and intentional, the way you're working with. Uh, aesthetic vocabularies from the African continent or the diaspora, but do you think of yourself as someone who's also, you know, shifting um, the critical terms um, just in a broader sense in terms of like a, a radical discourse, a feminist discourse, and certainly um, in the kind of prevailing terms of the art world? Is all of that in the studio with you? Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, intentionally or unintentionally, I've been um, a part of a, a lot of change in art. Um, when I came to New York, um, no one was interested in figurative sculpture, and no one was interested in ceramics. So um, those two things have really changed. So, um, And I also think that there's an ongoing kind of discourse around craftsmanship and whether it's important and beauty or necessary. Um, and I think I've, I've tried to engage that conversation as well. Um, some of the things I think that I might have been involved in are um, just because of the times that we live in. Um, I think that there's like many artists before me um, who were doing similar work but didn't have the opportunities that I have. Like, um, I just recently went to see Senga Nagudi's um, solo show in Philadelphia. Um, and I can't imagine if she was doing that work now um, what the reception would be. Um, and so I'm really aware of that. I'm really a aware of being very fortunate um, to, you know, I'm also doing a lot of things that are very expensive and need a lot of time and resources. And um, so very few people get that opportunity. So I must say, I just feel lucky right now. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to um, ask you a bit about um, 
you know, your practice in terms of projects like the waiting room and free people's medical clinic? Like when you started out, did you imagine yourself working across ceramics, sculpture? What, what people, no. criticism, they call it social practice. Do you think of it as social practice? I, you know, those, I mean, durational performances or, I mean, what is your own language for like the waiting room and the I people's was, medical clinic? Yeah. I was calling, I, I call it social sculpture. Okay. Um, okay. And the waiting room, which was a creative time project, um, uh, was something I did. Um, also, I did a project with, um, I did several projects that could be considered um, social practice or social sculpture um, because those were the opportunities I had. Rashida, who um, is in some ways kind of an ongoing curator for me, had asked me to do it. She was guest curator at Creative Time at the time. And uh, she thought it was something that I could do. And I thought if I was going to make my sculpture live, you know, what would it look like? And I thought that that form, the um, Free People's Medical Clinic that the Black Panthers had created, um, also for that particular location, um, would be an ideal way for me to um, make my work live, you know? Um, showing all kinds of different labor um, that's typically not visible um, that black women do. That is the reason why the world goes around, but trying to make it more visible. Um, but I, I could not get support for people. No one wanted to just give me money to make my own sculpture. Mm -hmm. So I started doing some of these only other projects because those were the projects that were funded. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, I was not that happy about it when I started, but I found that every time I did one of these projects, I did make a huge jump, um, sometimes conceptually, sometimes otherwise. It never hurt, so I don't complain about it anymore. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and so like, and you know, the kind of standard profile account of you, it's like 2010 is identified as this like, you know, a kind of watershed because you are mm. at the residency at the studio museum. So I wanted to just ask, so like, so what about, you know, the life in your studio in this decade before when you were just making work and how did that residency begin to shift things? So just in, in terms of thinking about your own accounts of your practice, and I guess in a, a movement more towards um, the figurative in your sculptural practice or well, before 2010, um, and still now, I was raising a girl, um, and she's <laughs> just getting into high school around then, so a lot of people focus on, you know, um, residencies or exhibitions and not, you know, getting a child into high school in New York City. I can relate. It's just way harder. <laughs> and um, so that was one thing that was going on, and then um, another thing is I had... Um, a big, sh really important show at the kitchen that Rashida curated, um, which was also kind of the first time I was able to uh, show a lot of different kinds of work that I was doing at the same time in one setting. Um, you know, it was my, I sort of was able to like, not just have a exhibition that was like a sentence, but like more like a paragraph, you know, I felt like I got like more, more space and, and people were starting to figure out what I was doing because there was a long period of time that it just seemed odd, um, which was my, I, it was really funny. One time my daughter came home and she was like, you know, actually she just started high school and she said, you know, my friends figured out that you're cool today. And <laughs> <laughs> we, th we think you're really cool. And I'm, she's like, before we just thought you were odd. <laughs> so yeah, it was a big year for me. Uh, and always. <laughs> and then with the, into that show that was bringing um, everything together, I mean, because film has also been a big component of your practice. I mean, and I know you're, after you leave here, you're going off to like scout for a film project. I don't know if you feel you're at liberty to talk about that, but what yeah. is the status of like film and the practice now? 
Um, I'm trying to be slower, and, and I had a lot of luck early um, just, like, making videos in my kitchen or with Liz Laser in my mother's church, and they were kind of, like, one-off, and, um, and they were kind of installed as, like, moving paintings, and, and they were part of exhibitions, not really necessarily their own work, and I was, it sort of worked for a while, and then it really stopped working for me, so this time, um, We've been making, I've been making a film with Madeline Hunt Ehrlich, um, and probably by the time we're done, it will be over the course of two years. Mm -hmm. And the next thing we're filming is a, a bonfire um, on Martha's Vineyard, so mm -hmm. I'm also figuring out a way to make it fun to okay. do this work. <laughs> and, so. do you want, and do you want to say anything more about the content of this film or no? No, that's okay. as far as I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I suspect it as much. Um, you know, in terms then of also thinking about the way you're referencing other traditions, I, you know, the work is also very architectural. And in that range mm -hmm. of reference, um, you know, these kind of African modes of dwelling are really central. And it seems that architecture, also that vocabulary provides um, a really critical way for you to think about Black being in the world. So I don't know if you want to just talk about those, the series of dwellings um, that some that are freestanding and some that become incorporated in these like black female forms where you uh, allude to um, the, you know, again, to the beautiful multiplicity of that form while also commenting on that violence, you know, so there's a way so who is the figure who can be made into an object or a tool or a vessel, but yet being an object or a tool or a vessel enables things to be made in the world. So it yeah. seems that you um, attend to both those aspects. Um, well, I started being really um, interested in uh, Nigerian pottery. I got a book that was actually called Nigerian Pottery and did an internship at the Smithsonian when I was 19 and worked with the ceramics curator there. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I came to New York, I found that like none of my interests were shared. Um, and also, ceramics was in a really difficult place um, in terms of the way it was understood. And it's almost like a forbidden material. It would have been easier for me to make work out of garbage mm -hmm. than ceramics at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, and I also didn't have like the same pedigree as most artists, so I think people thought I just didn't. I would like miss the plot or something, you know, and didn't know I wasn't supposed to be working <laughs> in ceramics. <laughs> and it was it was kind of a difficult thing to get over. A lot of people really didn't were sort of sculpture exhausted, didn't feel like we needed it anymore. So I I just. Um, kept going and I really benefited from being left alone because I was able to make a lot of mistakes and mature um, you know outside of the limelight um, and so I and think that's also why I'm able to have um, a lot of pleasure now is because I'm 53 and I'm not 33 I probably would have a nervous breakdown right now if it's 33 <laughs> but I don't, you know, I don't have any crazy friends anymore. I know how to take care of myself. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's really, really great to work at this age. And that's where I feel lucky again, because usually women disappear and they don't reemerge until they're like 80. Um, so I feel very, very lucky right now. And you, you said that you used the phrase, um, sculpture is exhausted. Or people, you know, assume that. And um, yeah. Helen, in her introduction, said, well, you know, you um that your work uh enabled her to see sculpture differently and i guess i want to ask you about what so what does it mean to take up um a devalued form because i feel like i take up devalued forms yeah. in my own work right yeah. and so you know who are forms devalued for right like um because that you know presumes that um they've been used to the point where they use lose all utility. Um, so why, why can you do what you do with sculpture and how is that um, kind of reanimation of the, of the power of sculpture as a form 
also connected to your turn towards the figurative? Well, I think that people, um, you know, that artists very sincerely wanted to, you know, get away from the kind of capitalist trap of the art world by, you know, dematerializing and making things that, you know, trying to figure out what they could make that couldn't be collected, although everything could be collected. Um, and um, and, I, and I, I understood why people were going that in direction, but when you think about most of the people in the world and most of the communities that I'm interested in, which are all in the global south, people make things, um, make objects and use them. Um, patina, history, time are, are real concerns. Um, there's a blur between um, function and concept in a way that doesn't really appear in Western sculpture all the time. And there's things that can, we can really learn from these other spaces. And so I feel like this Marxist argument about material didn't just sort of miss that. Bit. It just had the big gap you know, that wasn't, you know, I'm thinking about me. You know, I mean, that's a, a point that, you know, the philosopher Denise Ferreira de Silva actually makes about your work. She says that there's, you know, um, that there's a kind of a discourse of the aesthetic, uh, Western aesthetics that are predicated on certain divisions, mm -hmm. but the, the how to make and the impulse to make in the work um, really it's always about the wedding of the aesthetic and the everyday, the condition of life. Mm -hmm. So the aesthetic mm -hmm. isn't, uh, isn't separated from that at all. I'm just, thinking, I, I'm just thinking about Denise's film that I just saw recently. She's so amazing. So, and then I also wanted to say, so um, I feel like one of the most important things I've done um, besides sculpture was the Lupole Retreat Conference that I did with you and Tina Camp at the Guggenheim. Um, and then afterwards it was published in um, EFLUX, e yeah, yeah, yeah. a whole edition of EFLUX. And so we will, um, that's the one thing I can say about Venice, we will have another Lupole Retreat, so it's great. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, just, and, and again, I'm an outsider to the art world, but um, for those of us who are actually there in that space of the Guggenheim for this conference with basically black women artists, thinkers, writers from all over the globe. I was like, wait, how do we make the Guggenheim into like black feminist church? But we did. <laughs> it was great. People were like, what? <laughs> you it was know, the, you know, one of my favorite days. Yeah. yeah. It was a great day. Exactly. And so for, since we did touch upon Venice, I know you're not going to reveal anything about the context of uh, Venice, but do you, what are your aspirations for Venice? Because it's, I mean, on the one hand, it's, sig you know, to say it is significant that you are representing the U.S. in Venice is like an understatement, right? And so, mm. um, but what is, yeah, what is I it? would say that I decided to not um, reflect on the current moment that we're in. I think it'll take me 10 years to get over between November 3rd and January 6th. Um, I'm just not, I don't feel like my thoughts and feelings are distilled enough to really like immediately respond. You know, I did think, I was like, I could just fill the whole pavilion with garbage, but I think that's already been done before <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but you know, I just, I, I just decided that it was more interesting. Like there's things I've been wanting to do for so long um, in terms of the reenactments of certain forms and histories. Um, and I have the ability right now um, to, I just feel like I'm ready to do a different show than the show I would have done if I was responding to now. So that's the decision I made. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, when you were talking about um, reenacting certain forms, I, I remember when I was an undergraduate, um, taking an art history class with um, Rick Powell, now one of, you know, mm. a senior uh, African-American art historian. And, you know, and I think in the first class of the first week, we did um, the face jugs. And mm. so, again, 
if you just want to talk about so again what is that what does it mean to kind of reference that kind of a history of making and doing and then what does it mean to situate that kind of object remade in you know the Guggenheim or um, the pavilion at Venice um, um. Well, the face jug, um, and I should say that there's a really important face jug um, exhibition that's coming to the mat, that's going to be at the mat, that includes um, many jugs that come from edge wheel, edge, edge, Edgefield Pottery um, in South Carolina, um, which was a kiln that was operated entirely by slaves, um, and it became a really important um, you know, event in African American, in American history, because um, Dave the slave, um, David Drake, David the potter, uh, worked there, and he also signed his pots, and he would sometimes write uh, short poems on his pots. So, because he did this, we we know a lot a lot about this pottery, in particular, but we don't know why people made face jugs or what their actual function is. Mm -hmm. um, they were outlawed, they were not to be made, so they had to be sort of made on the sly. Um, they were taken care of and preserved very well, but we don't know, <clears throat> which is something that's very typical in your work and mine, these like big unknowns. And um, instead of being frustrated by that, I find that um, that kind of thing will leave an opening for me when it comes to sculpture. But then there's also a lot of before current era representations of blackness that are also quite curious. Um, in RISD, there's this little bronze um, jug with a lid called like Negro with lidded head. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, um, I don't know, 5,000 years old. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of mystery around these objects. Um, and I find that they very strongly uh, speak to the present. So anything that you want to add or touch upon that I haven't addressed yet? I was going to ask an, um, one more question about loophole. Should we open it for questions now? or Yeah. yeah. And I guess I, I wanted to just revisit, um, you know, loophole where um, the title comes from a chapter of the uh, slave narrative of Harriet Jacobs, and in so many ways that, you know. You know, I think maybe no one knows what loophole of retreat even is in this audience. Maybe. Do, do people know what loophole of retreat is? Let's I mean, talk I about it. I think about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was the name of your um, exhibition. My exhibition at the Guggenheim and the conference. Right. And basically, uh, Simone titled that after um, a chapter in the narrative of Harriet Jacobs called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, and it's a chapter called um, The Loophole of Retreat, and it articulates the central paradox. So basically, Harriet Jacobs is you know, escaping from her slave owner, Dr. Flint, who also has um, sexual designs on her. But what she does is she actually escapes to a small shed on the plantation and the dimensions of that structure are like what seven feet by three feet seven feet by three feet and she lives in there for seven years she writes mm. letters to her children um, that are posted from the north so that the paradox is she escapes slavery but she's in the space of greater in confinement so mm. it's like what does it mean to enact a practice of freedom in the context of a really great enclosure? And it's all about the arts of like cunning and subterfuge and the way she... And she also can you know, see out. She can see out. She, so she's able to watch her children. And so, so then, given that context, so why did you entitle your exhibition The Loophole of Retreat? I, well, um... I had been thinking about, and I even created a film that uh, didn't work at the Guggenheim, um, about the story of um, the Africa family um, and um, the year that I got 
uh, the Hugo Boss Award, which is why I was having the show at the Guggenheim. Um, maybe I don't know if I can take, tell this really long story, but anyway, a woman who had to have her child um, inside jail um, was, you know, and she was helped by other black women to have the child, and she was able to uh, keep the child without letting the guards know. Like three uh, for three days, um, and so she labored by herself and took care of this child. And the child, uh, the other women would um, sing or make noises, cough, do whatever they could to distract the guards. They would get away with it for three days. So um, it was another interstitial space, another loophole of retreat. So it seems like um, this is a very symbolic uh, description of the life of black women in general. Yeah. So maybe on that note, we can now open it up for Q&A. Yeah, that sounds yeah. great. And also comments from collaborators and friends are welcome. Um, great talk. Uh, congratulations on all your success, Simone. Uh, my question is your organic growth in your practice. You've kept your purity going. I wanted to know what your uh, help was to navigate through the commercial side, through galleries, and also through institutions, and what kind of decisions you had to make and who influenced them as you progressed to where you are today. Um, well, I think it, I didn't think I was going to be successful. So um, that's very liberating because then you just make whatever you want, you know. Um, when you, you're not making work for uh, an audience, um, trying to imagine what that audience might want, um, I, I wouldn't even know how to do that. So that is, was pretty easy when you're like being left alone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Simone. Welcome to our small town, and welcome to Anderson Ranch. Thank you. I'm a longtime fangirl also of your ceramics, and I wanted to ask you a question about the characteristic of ceramic for your language is really beautiful together. How would you say your language has changed at scale and in bronze? Um. So that has been um, a really important shift. Um, if I didn't have the Highline opportunity, I wouldn't be working in bronze. Um, the Brick House was the first bronze that I ever made. Um, and so I didn't realize until I made that work that ceramics is almost like a training for um, bronze clay modeling. Um, I have, I'm still maybe losing 50% of whatever I fire in a kiln um, because I push things to extremes and also because of ceramics. Um, and so I'm very comfortable, familiar, expectant of loss. Um, and everything about um, bronze making is very precious. And so if you're not concerned about loss, you can move really quickly. So I found that it was, um, and also I don't have to worry about um, all the things you have to worry about to get something through a ceramic process, like, you know, bubbles in the walls or clay thickness, time, drying. I don't have to worry about those things with bronze clay modeling. So it's actually, you know, very liberating. It's like if you were um, a sprinter and then at 50 you realize actually you were great at, you know, running marathons, you know. But the sprinting training was really effective for marathon running. It's something like that. Um, also, it's been, what's been a struggle and what was great about um, coming here to um, Anderson Ranch, which is um, a lot more accommodating for visual artists, is even though I work in a traditional medium like clay, I um, don't use it. You know, I use it to make sculpture. So, for example, most kilns are made. Most um, tools, equipment is made so that you can make a pot or a plate. 
um, not so you can make an eight foot figure. Um, if you fire a salt kiln, most people will add 10 pounds of salt. And I'm like, why not add 50 pounds of salt? And it's hard to push those boundaries because there's all these, all these sort of invisible norms in ceramics that are based on you know, making pottery. So it's been a, a struggle to have the means and space and time, um, especially working in New York, um, to really push things. But now I, you know, I have that opportunity. So I would say that's why a lot of my surfaces look different is because I work at extremes. Um, and at this point, I found I'm really comfortable at around um, seven, eight foot scale. So, lucky. <laughs> Simone, what were your uh, growing up experiences that influenced your artistic career? And how did you come to ceramics? Um, I came to ceramics because I went to a Quaker school in Indiana that has a really um, intense relationship with Japan. We had a lot of Japanese um, artists and teachers on campus. And um, I studied with uh, Michael Thiedemann, um, who studied with Warren McKenzie, who studied with uh, Bernard Leach. So I'm like technically in the Bernard Leach uh, family tree. <laughs> Um, so I had this really, I also was fascinated with American studio pottery because it's kind of a, a very orientalist, bizarre American practice, um, kind of like yoga, you know, it's like, why are we speaking Sanskrit, you know, in the middle of Aspen, you know, it's like weird American reasons. <laughs> um, and, um, but I, I, you know, soon after, um, so I had kind of a conceptual interest in ceramics as well as just uh, affinity for the material. And I still don't know what's coming out of the kiln next week. So I just love it. It's like a, you know, endless learning. My growing, I had a very uh, peculiar, I don't know, bizarre childhood. I'm like, my parents are missionaries. And so I don't really know, I haven't figured that out yet, how my childhood <laughs> is related. <laughs> I really don't know. We didn't travel. My father had a mission in Chicago, in the middle of Chicago, from Jamaica. So it was very interesting. Hi, my name is Lara Whitley. I'm a local artist here. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm standing back. <laughs> I really appreciated what you said about getting your daughter into high school, and I was wondering what advice you can give to us working mom artists. Well, I just think that being a parent is really good for artists. Um, I always felt like it was so unfortunate. It was really, um, I mean, I knew a lot of women artists who hid that they have children for long periods of time because they thought it would end their careers. So I'm glad things have changed a little bit, somewhat. Um, but you know, raising a girl in New York is not is so much harder than being an artist, you know. Um, and I think it's important. Like after the big thing that happened to me having a child is that I'm no longer the most important person in the world, and I think that's been really good for me too. You know, there's always like, I can't even pee. Somebody is, I have to think about somebody else before. <laughs> so um, it's like, um, that, that was really good. That kind of, um, I, I think it's good to be humbled in that way when you're trying to um, work. And it, it's, it's just been supportive of me. And I, before I had a kid, I would take two or three hours to get to the studio. I'd have to get some rice and peas, and then I would have to cry for an hour and then clean, and then I would start working, and now I just work. Yeah. You know, after parenting, I don't waste time. So I found that it's been really, you know, helpful for me for lots of reasons. Simone Sadia, it's been an honor, a privilege to be here and um, present for this conversation. I'm so um, happy you're here. <laughs> Uh, so your sculptural practice is, I mean, the reference to vessels as a form is very evident. But I also think of your practice as uh, this vessel for um, 
for collabor collaboration and um, this coming together of fields of knowledge. And I just wanted to know if, um, if you think of the two things um, in relation, those two aspects in relation to each other, and also how your practice became this sort of vessel for um, the kinds of um, people and um, thought processes that it brings together. Do you want to speak to that? You know, I, I think that's a great question. I mean, I, I when you were answering the question about being a parent, um, you know, when I think of your work, and I think that this is true of many great artists, the work is so much bigger than the individual artists who makes it. Mm -hmm. And I think that your sense of um, what is owed and what, and what you want to give back is really huge in relationship to the kind of traditions you're working with. And I think the collaborative part, I think it's also related to what you call the social practice or social um, sculpture, but I think of it as like a black social poesis. I mean, it's this <laughs> an expanded process of making that encompasses, you know, a range of people who are doing things in the world. And some of those people are making discrete objects. Some of those people are making movements and sound. Some of those people are like trying to make social change, right? But it's but it's just very organically related for you. But I think that it's because in a way you're like the vessel for this thing that's actually greater than you. And maybe that's one thing. I think you've recognized that for a long time, even as you were crying in your studio for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel like I didn't have... Um, for 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 lots of reasons, um, because uh, the generation of Black women before me um, were really not supported. I didn't have like a whole um, the mentors I would have wanted to have, and I try to be um, the artist I would have wanted to have for myself. And which is the same thing we do as parents, and it's like very kind of liberating in a way you yeah know? and has mixed results and has mixed results <laughs> um but also um it's just also um a ceramic system something i can do by myself i went i um don't have or didn't have access to atmosphere acquiring um in new york and really always wanted to do it so um i would get a group of typically eight or 10 women and go to um, Watershed in Maine and fire my work for many years. And um, Sarah came with me one time um, and we fired wood and salt kilns there. And so that kind of collaboration seems like really integral to just making the work, but also um, I think also a way for me to have um, a better quality of life, you know, um, not and then it I don't know it's just um always worked for me and always made sense as a way to work and um I've been successful so far so <laughs> and then also Deborah and I collaborated on a work which included um, your work the manual notes that we read for a sound work for RISD that I was talking about earlier which will um travel in a Nancy Elizabeth Prophet show to the Brooklyn Museum, so that'll be great. I thought if people didn't mind, I'd be the second to last question, but Anne, you go first, and then I'll, I'll be, be second the last. Anne, you can be I'll, the you be penultimate, I'll be last. And that was like the perfect segue, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, thank you. So, um, I just want to say, when I heard that the two of you were speaking here, I was like, I'm coming to Aspen. Aww. This is this is like I love you all, but I really love them, and um, and um, and I just met Sadia for the first time. I've been a huge fan. When I read her book last summer, I think it like saved my life. You're just like amazing. So anyway, <laughs> total fangirling both of you. Um, but I I wanted to know a little bit like you know when I think about both of you and your work, there's so much similarity, even though you have different media, right? Um, it's about dignity of seeing, and it's about love. Mm -hmm and grace mm -hmm. and honesty. And so I'm just curious, how did you two get to know each other? And, and what is the story of your relationship? Well, you know, we're all four here. Um, I was uh, in the Berlin Biennial with Oakley. Um, we were both artists in the Biennial and um, we walked into the courtyard at the Cave and 
Sadia and Tina were having coffee. That's how we met. <laughs> But, but I feel you like also had bicycles, which was adorable. I know, and uh, and, uh, and, and, like, and Tina was laughing at me after too many glasses of wine, riding a bicycle at night in Berlin. <laughs> it was not a pretty picture. But 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 I feel like I want, um, I would love a way of naming our this collective thing that we are a part of, which is, um, which is about. It feels like it's about friendship. It feels like it's about collaboration. It feels like it's about the circulation of ideas and also just some, also, you know, um, helping to hold and regard one another as we make the work. And I think that there, um, that there's a constellation of values that um, we share. Yeah, that we share yeah. and that really, that really holds us. You know, and I think partly when you were talking about that beauty, um, you know, that's Lucille Clifton, that's Audre Lorde, that's a tradition of black women making art, um, who June Jordan, beauty is not a luxury, right? It's the, a necessity for everyday life. It's equipment for living. So what does it mean to want to make work, um, but in a way that uh, is not at all rarefied and not disconnected from you know the world we're inhabiting. I think that's a perfect way to end. Uh, any more questions? Oh, uh, no. I think that's a perfect way to end too. Okay. I want to thank you both so much for gracing yeah. us with your presence. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Sadia. That was really nice. And everyone, please come back tonight to hear Liz Wright sing and or tomorrow uh, to hear Sadia read from her book. Uh, tonight at 6, tomorrow at 12.30. Thanks, everybody.